After more than a year marked by national tragedy, Lebanon has a new government. But with the same parties in power and the same factional divisions, can this cabinet and its billionaire prime minister pull the country out of a historic economic crisis? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Lebanon. According to new Lebanese Prime Minister Najib Mikati, there is no magic wand to cure Lebanon's many ills. But at least now there is a government. After 13 months without one, its first meeting focused on recovering from one of the world's worst economic meltdowns. Mikati has promised to resume negotiations with the International Monetary Fund in order to get aid money flowing back into the country. The new cabinet replaces a caretaker administration that resigned following last year's deadly explosion at Beirut's ports. Mikati says there's no time to lose and warned there's no easy path out of the crisis. But with the general election scheduled for May, the government is hopeful it can turn things around. We don't have a magic wand. The situation is very difficult, but with a strong will, determination and planning, as a team, we can achieve what our patient and suffering nation is expecting from us, as Prime Minister Najib Mikati said. Well, around three out of every four people in Lebanon now live below the poverty line. Power cuts plus massive shortages of food and fuel make everyday life difficult at best. The country's economic collapse saw the currency lose more than 90% of its value. Now, successive governments have failed to tackle corruption and political inertia. So can the richest man in the country turn Lebanon around? Construction and telecoms magnate Najib Bakati has been prime minister twice before. He's pledged to fix supply shortages and shore up the nation's reserves. But most Lebanese say they've heard it all before. I've been waiting here for around two hours, and we still don't know whether we will fill our cars or not. This is the peak of patience. As for the government that was formed, it is another face of the ruling class. We are now suffering from a class that led us here. It is this same class that produced this government, but with different names. Therefore, I honestly don't expect much from it. So with people feeling hopeless about the new government, Lebanon's Iran-aligned Hezbollah group has stepped in to try to ease the fuel shortages themselves. Its leader, Hassan Nasrallah, says Hezbollah has bought tons of fuel from Iran that should arrive on Thursday. The oil tanker carrying the first shipment docked in Syria and trucks are now carrying that fuel overland the rest of the way. Hezbollah's opponents have criticized the purchase, saying it violates U.S. sanctions, Earlier this month, U.S. lawmakers warned that importing Iranian oil could have severely damaging consequences. So let's look further at this new government and what it can achieve, as well as the larger geopolitical dynamics at play in Lebanon. From Beirut, I'm joined by analyst Diana Menhem. She was the senior economic advisor at the U.N. office in Beirut. She's now the managing director of the Lebanese NGO, Kuluna Irada. Mustafa Alush joins us from Tripoli. He's the vice president of Saad Hariri's Future Movement Party and a former member of the Lebanese parliament. And in the U.S. Capitol is resident fellow at the Arab Center, Washington, D.C., Joe Macaron. Thanks all so much for being with us. You know, we want to see the formation uh, of a government after this long as progress. But, Diana, is it progress? We have the same constitutionally enforced factional divisions, all the same parties and all the same powers vying for influence via proxy behind them. Absolutely, Andrea. I mean, understanding how this government is formed is really essential to, to setting our expectations of, of what this government can or cannot achieve. So, as you just said, this is a government that was formed according to the same sectarian power sharing lines that have dominated the logic of power sharing in Lebanon for the past 30 years. This is a government that had to wait for international interference for it to be formed. We have been waiting for a government for 13 months. A government was not formed until an Iranian-French alignment took place with the U.S. cover. 
And most importantly, this is a government that was formed by the same forces that have brought the country to this political deadlock and to the economic abyss that we are in. And therefore, not much expectations out of it. Okay, Mustafa Alush, I mean, is this new government uh, really different in your opinion? Can it actually make any fundamental changes in order to put Lebanon back on a path uh, toward recovery? Well, I cannot add too much on what uh, our colleague said from Beirut. Uh, the only thing is that the, what is important, despite the, 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 how this government has been formed, uh, is that we have to have a government. Even at the worst sit, uh, situations, uh, any government should be there in order to uh, be responsible at least for what's happening and to guide uh, a few things, to change the mood a bit. However, I, I definitely don't expect miracles from, uh, though we need a miracle, but I don't expect miracles from this government specifically, uh, not only because how it was formed and uh, not only because it's the same uh, uh, gang of uh, powers uh, that uh, have uh, been reigning over Lebanon for decades is the reason. But the situation in Lebanon specifically, where uh, we still have part of Lebanon, at least, uh, is uh, occupied by an Iranian uh, decision-making, at least from uh, uh, regarding the uh, power, the, guard, uh, the uh, security. And now, we have, we, as we have seen, uh, uh, what Hassan Nasrallah said yesterday, mm -hmm. that is still, uh, he's now also governing the issue of uh, 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 fuel and the issue of uh, how things should be done in the next uh, coming years, probably, or months, we don't know. Okay. Then uh, we, we, we need a government. This right. is it. And we have a government now, and they should do whatever they can do. Mustafa, it's fascinating to hear your perspective on this because you were for many years the government itself. If you can, you know, enact some, some critical observation here on your own peers and yourself and your own peers. What is it? What is it that stops you from doing what good government should do? Any government should have all the powers in its hand. And what I mean all powers, it means if you are uh, if you are responsible for the economy, you're responsible for uh, 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 getting people to go to school and uh, for uh, uh, the social security. You cannot uh, say that this is uh, this is my responsibility, but responsi the the other responsibility concerning security, international relations, should be left to Hassan Nasrallah or anyone else in the region. So uh, this is why the, uh, accepting this dichotomy or this, uh, this status of uh, non-power at the same time you are in power, then uh, all the problems that you will be facing will come back to you and you, uh, people will say that you have failed. This is why I, all, I have always been inside my, uh, my party. Someone is saying that uh, you either give all powers to the, those who are reigning now, and I'm talking about Hezbollah and his allies, and then uh, you, you go to the uh, opposition, or you should not accept being in power without powers. Okay. Let me ask Joe, I mean, do, do you think uh, what Mustafa's just said there is, is a fair critique, or is it a case of, as many Lebanese say, every politician using other politicians and parties as a scapegoat for their own failures? I mean, there's a blame to go uh, across Lebanese political class. Uh, some of the ministers that were selected by by uh, Prime Minister Jibiati were also named before in the, the formation by uh, by uh, by uh, uh, Saad Hari, the former Prime Minister. Uh, also, the former Prime Minister Saad Hari has a lot of the key security positions still under his control, and also in, in key allies across the central bank and in the economic uh, sector at large. Uh, so yes, Hezbollah have a co control over the security decision, over a lot of aspects of the Lebanese political system, but also there are, uh, whether Hariri, whether in the uh, central bank governor, also there is a lot of questionable uh, uh, policy making, decision making, 
uh, ability how to run the country in general that led to the first uprising uh, in 2019. Um, so uh, I think the blame go across the political class. Not, okay. uh, definitely there's uh, more in, in others than some, but we cannot just have one party. I think the blame goes beyond uh, what you're talking about. Well, understood. And the structural issues as well, of course, within the government, as, as everyone has noted. Um, but, Diana, let me come back to you, because now the, this government now is trying to move forward with uh, resuming talks with the IMF. It's key. Um, but specifically with Yusuf Khalil as finance minister, do you think uh, Beirut will be able to convince the IMF to get money back into the country? We must remember here that um, a government uh, plan, a financial reform plan, was presented by the former government. That was, I mean, a good plan. It was a decent plan and a very good starting point for negotiations by the IMF. And this plan was shot down by parliament, by a parliamentary committee that included representatives from all the key political parties that are in power today. The same parliament is still today, it exists today. The same parliamentary committee can do the exact same work. So I do not understand what is the variable that, that we are expecting or that we are betting on in order to expect a different result. The same people are still in power. Mm. Regarding Mr. Yusuf Al-Khalil and negotiations with the IMF, I mean, it is no secret that um, Riyad Saleme, the governor of the central bank, and of course the team around him, of which Mr. Khalil was part, um, have, have really had a very tough time convincing the IMF of the figures that they had been presenting, of the of the financial and fiscal targets that they uh, of the financial and monetary targets that they have been setting, and uh, and I think that in addition to Mr. Khalil, there will be various figures in government that will also be part of this negotiation, notably the deputy uh, prime minister. They definitely want to engage in the IMF. This government wants to engage with the IMF. The extent to which it will be able to commit to meaningful reforms that the IMF is going to impose as conditions is really um, very far-fetched and is highly doubted. Very far-fetched, because it is the same system, just maybe a little reshuffling of the faces. So, Diana, let me ask you this then. If, it is, uh, if that system needs to be broken in order to, mm -hmm. to start over for Lebanon, will we see a better organized opposition able to run against those embedded powers here in nine months' time when a general election is supposed to be held? Yes, definitely. And the, and the opposition is already organizing itself. It has already accumulated a lot of, um, a lot of uh, experience. It has already had a lot of battles that it has won in the past uh, year and a half, battles of representation. I mean here elections for, of student bodies, elections in syndicates, and the opposition continues to grow, to organize better, and to get ready for the elections. But I'd like to also, Andrea, get back to your previous question. Not only will these reforms, I mean, it's doubted that these reforms are going to take place because the same parliamentarians are in power, but also because these reforms mean that this political class will be shooting itself in the leg. These reforms tackle the very interests of this political class, and it's very hard for them to relinquish um, these interests and these vested interests uh, by enacting uh, these reforms. At the very best, in my opinion, what we can expect this government to do is try to decelerate the pace of the economic crash, try to have some patches, at least socially, in order to try to buy time and buy allegiance ahead of the upcoming elections if they happen. Okay. Mustafa Lush, I want to get your response to that, because in order to, as she says, uh, enact the truly necessary reforms, the political class, would basically have to shoot itself in the foot. Is that what's happening? Uh, well, yes, definitely. Because uh, mostly the, the old type of uh, governing in Lebanon and uh, uh, our uh, type of democracy, which is a kind of democracy, this is what I can say, is definitely based on uh, how much you can serve your constituents uh, from uh, the account of the government. Uh, of the state, anyway. So uh, definitely, uh, the many of the uh, already established uh, uh, political powers in Lebanon 
probably they will lose their uh, places if there uh, will be a re reform. But a real reform, as uh, I, uh, we, you said, and I, I would say definitely, needs a good opposition, an opposition which is well organized and has uh, figures that can speak uh, officially uh, concerning its aims and what uh, it wants. And they need a, a political plan, political and economic plan. Till now, we're still waiting and definitely when, uh, when I was discussing with my friends in some key figures in the opposition, telling them that we need to hear from you your plan and who will represent you in order to uh, put all the uh, already established parties between brackets, if we can call them party parties, uh, in the corner and uh, uh, tell them that you have to improve, you have to change. But till now, I don't, I'm not sure what will happen in the next uh, eight months, seven months, five months. It's still doubtful that it, there will be a plan that we can see. There will be a leadership then we, uh, which is transparent and, or apparent. This is why, yes, we need a good opposition in order for us to right. uh, transform the country in some way. Okay. Uh, it's, it's frustrating because, I mean, it seems like the system that is built and entrenched in the Constitution, it's a system of deadlock, but as many Lebanese argue, it somehow stops the country from descending into worse, from potentially descending into back to the civil war that this system brought it out of. Um, I want to move on, if I can, at this point, though, with Joe, uh, because we had spoken at the top of the program about this Iranian oil shipment. I mean, the fuel shortages right now in Lebanon are just crippling. Um, the society. Uh, the economic crisis is one thing, but not being able to get basic gas to fuel your car, heat your home, or you cook, uh, is, is really pushing people toward the brink. So now, um, with this admittedly much needed Iranian fuel shipment finally on its way, we are seeing Lebanon, Joe, sink deeper into that proxy war of influence between Hezbollah and Iran versus the U.S and other Arab powers. First, in practical terms, did Iran manage to come to the rescue first? And then second, um, what does that mean to Lebanon as regards its relationship with the US and consequences for potentially breaking international sanctions? A lot of questions. I'd like to, I'll try to uh, unpack them. Uh, I think the US has always concerned that Lebanon doesn't go too much on relying on Iran or Russia or otherwise. Uh, and I think this is why part of the mistake of the U.S. ambassador in Lebanon, how to use this card of, of the Egyptian gas in reaction uh, to the Iranian fuel coming uh, through Hezbollah uh, 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 press conference that was made by, by, by its Secretary General. Uh, so I think Iran doesn't have the money, uh, nor Hezbollah have the intention to expand these reliances. But I think it was used as a leverage to pressure the the Americans to shift their policy. It means on the government especially. It means we cut all aid or we suspend all aid until the government is formed. Now this dynamic has have changed after that. So the proxy war in Lebanon has been going on for uh, at least since uh, 2005. Uh, it's growing over time. And now because the crisis got deeper, so the involvement got deeper, uh, the Syrian regime is, is, uh, is uh, significantly reduced. So now you have U.S. and Iran basically filling uh, the vacuum. Uh, this administration in specific, the Biden administration, is not very interested in Lebanon. It's been delegating to, to French uh, foreign policy to deal with this, uh, uh, with this issue. And this is why we saw this uh, uh, delay somehow in, 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 in forming the government until basically Iran got to a point where it can use this as a card uh, in the negotiation with the uh, Biden administration. Okay. Uh, beyond that, uh, the fuel crisis in Lebanon, it's, uh, it's not, I think, necessarily linked to what's happening ex externally. The black market, uh, the, the control of the fuel, hiding them before selling them on a higher market, the uh, unraveling of the state. Uh, the last government disappeared from the scene completely after its resignation. So there's a lot of internal factor. We can't just blame that U.S. or Iran are going to save because what U.S. and Iran are offering at this point are not long-term solution, are not structural solution. The Iranian fuel is not enough or 
uh, or even the plan by the U.S. for Egyptian gas is not enough uh, to solve the problem. There's more need for structural problems. And all those problems are, who are responsible for all those problems are U.S. allies and Iranian allies. So we don't yeah. expect them to, to solve the problem they created uh, through their allies. Right. I mean, Diana, what do you think? At, you know, at what cost uh, Lebanon takes uh, assistance from Iran? And I mean, what, what kind of trade-offs between proxy powers can actually be managed here? Would, would Gulf states be able to offer more than Iran in, in order to counter Iranian influence? I mean, we're going to see this uh, unfolding over the next uh, couple of weeks. You already have Jordan that is discussing whether it could provide gas to Lebanon. We already have Egypt talking about the same issue. So, yes, uh, there is uh, this proxy war that is taking place, but also there is this um, complicit or uh, implicit uh, OK um, by the international powers for this uh, to happen. I mean, um, th these, are, these are moves at a level which requires some kind of implicit OK between the uh, different international powers. And this is what we have seen, especially, uh, du uh, especially during the government formation uh, process. I mean, it's very sad to see that the same political parties that have systematically destroyed the state are today trying to play the role of the state by using their uh, allies. Uh, I mention here Hezbollah because it has most prominently been able to do this, but also other political parties who are trying to do this, but with limited success, which mu with much less success. Of course, today, the, the most prominent um, actor is Hezbollah, taking over uh, key uh, uh, state uh, institutions and bluntly playing the role of the state and saying, listen, I am here to stay and my, uh, my ally, uh, Iran, uh, is here to increase its influence even further. Right. I'll tell you what, we are down to our last few minutes. Um, so, Mustafa Alush, I want to take it back to Lebanon itself, um, how Lebanese are dealing with their daily lives now. You know, the world really watched in horror during Lebanon's civil war. The country was emotionally and economically devastated, yet today we're actually hearing um, that those who were adults during the Civil War saying the economic situation right now is far worse than at the height of that conflict. How is that possible? Well, I lived for uh, during my teenage and uh, more during the Civil War. And uh, I think that we are still in Civil War, but it's, it's not... Uh, 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 armed because only one party has arms. But during the Civil War, there were enough money coming from the proxy, uh, uh, those who are using the Lebanese by proxy. And uh, there were enough uh, 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 income for, uh, for uh, the fighters to uh, uh, still go, uh, go on. And this is why we did not have that shortage uh, that much. However, definitely we had uh, disasters during uh, those years. Uh, example, in 1986, the Lebanese uh, pound lost, uh, uh, became uh, at one time 2% of what it used to be uh, during the 1982. So we had this uh, uh, huge deterioration between 1986 and 1988. Right. And definitely in 1992, uh, this uh, became a di this what uh, made things change at that time. So uh, probably, but do you, do you it's feel worse forgetting. today about the, the situation the country is in? No, definitely, because I have lived the horrors of being uh, possibly killed at any time okay. by passing through uh, a, a barricade or whatever. This is why. The situation now is worse because we are living it now. But what we, we, we used to live in, we're reminiscing uh, uh, what happened at, at those days. Okay. Joe, I can give you uh, one final minute, uh, your thoughts. Um, and let me ask you if, if you think it can get better in the near future. 
I think it's, we cannot compare to the civil war. The situation was uh, catastrophic in that sense, security-wise, the, the militia, the security of, of, of the people around. I, I lived through the civil war, and uh, I understand that. Now, I don't think we can get more deeper than what we are now, but I think the coming two years are going to be very difficult. Uh, this government uh, is, I think, a puppet of the political class, between quotation. It's there to manage. Uh, the co co collapse before, and so the political leaders don't take the blame before the election, uh, coming election. Uh, but beyond that, without having a real shift in the political dynamic, I don't see a long-term uh, solution in Lebanon. And uh, and uh, now we are just in the stage of managing the collapse okay. instead of trying to get out of it. Joe, that will have to be the last word. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists sincerely so much for being with us on this edition of the Newsmakers, and thank. Our viewers, of course, for tuning in as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter at B underscore Newsmakers. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page. I'm Andrea Sankey, and we'll see you next time.